for a long time, it was often very easy to classify because most of us thought of that if you have a young child who is presenting to you with ketosis, it becomes uh, type 1. If you have an obese child, it becomes type 2. Now, what are the major challenges that we see in adolescents in terms of classification, Dhani? Uh, in adolescents, why uh, type 1 remains uh, so there is a lot of confusion between type 1 and type 2. The key message, however, is that you should err in the side of caution of diagnosing type 1 rather than type 2 because otherwise you will be in a confusion because you don't want to create acts of omission, which will basically mean that you will basically do a scenario in which you will be saying that, okay, I am using, uh, not using insulin and that is going to go ahead in terms of developing DK or other problems which may happen in that perspective. Now, what are the most important clinical parameters which will tell you that this is non-type 1 diabetes, particularly in an adolescent age group? In terms of clinical parameters, yeah. the BMI is one of the most important. Okay. So, BMI in the sense of what? So that is the most important indicator of type 2. But that's what uh, Dhani said currently that obesity is rising. So what is the most important parameter? Yes. So lack of ketosis and low insulin requirement. These will be the most important parameter to look at. Because if you are needing insulin for a long time, then probably you don't need to worry that much about from that perspective. So we'll try to cover about the various forms of diabetes, the classification and how do we use it in terms of clinical perspective. I, if your onset is before six months, it's usually neonatal diabetes, go for imaging and genetic studies. If after six months and there is a DK at presentation, insulin requirement is there, this is type 1 diabetes, no insulin requirement, you do a GAD antibody to classify into type 1 versus genetic based upon that perspective. If there is no decayed presentation beyond 10 years, we would recommend that you do a GAD antibody to classify type 1 versus type 2 and MODI. So main thing to look at is the age of onset, need for insulin, and then whether somebody is obese or not. So again, if you go back to that study, I was talking about three things they talked about, whether insulin is needed or not, what is the age and how much is the BMI. These three are the major criteria. So 16-year-old girl with increased urine output, honey, sugars are high, HPA1C 8%, lean individual, no acanthosis, ketone were negative, labeled as type 1, now develops recurrent hypoglycemia. Do you think you need to evaluate further? Ask for history of diabetes in family. Yes. So you have to look at the strong family history. So can this be lipodystrophy-like scenario? No acanthosis. And of course, you are insulin, you are developing hypoglycemia, which means you are insulin sensitive. So this is more of a problem of insulin production. If at all, so either it's a beta cell failure which is progressive because of autoimmunity, or there is some genetic cause. So definitely in this scenario, you have to start thinking of some possibility. And in this scenario, you will do a GAD antibody. And GAD antibody was negative. So in this scenario, you have to start thinking of a genetic diagnosis, which turned out to be HNF1 alpha. 16-year-old boy with polyuria, sugars are very high. HbA1c is 10%. There is ketosis. DK was there. Insulin was started. Then requirement came down. And he was... Overweight, obese, there was type 2 diabetes in family, started on insulin, uh, was stopped and metformin was started. Do you agree with this line of evaluation? So before you label anybody as a case of type 2 diabetes, you should do a GAD antibody to get the confirmation. And this is what comes from the uh, guidelines from ISPAD. And clearly GAD antibody was positive and insulin should have been continued. So don't label anybody as type 2. Five-day-old girl with birth weight of 1800, failure to thrive, 
करंट वेट इज सिक्सटीन हंड्रेड ग्राम सिक लुकिंग शुगर इज हाई कीटोन इज नेगेटिव डिहाइड्रेटेड फ्लूड एंड इंसुलिन डू यू थिंक दिस इज वॉट फॉर्म ऑफ न्यूनेटल डायबिटीज ट्रांसियंट और परमानेंट so this is neonatal diabetes but whether it is transient or permanent very early onset no ketosis goes more in favor of a transient however you cannot exclude that but this is more likely to be a transient form so first week of life onset birth weight tends to be lower in that perspective ketoacidosis is less common so these all try towards a this thing and you of course have to look at whether there are any particular features of imprinting disorders like omphalocele ear creases you will get those things so this was present so this was a 6q24 defect now what you expect here is that they will have a improvement and then they may have a recurrence which may happen around adolescence two month old boy with failure to thrive birth weight was 25 now 2800 hepatomegaly myopathy and weakness very high sugars and very high triglycerides mitochondrial neonatal diabetes so it's permanent likely what are the most common permanent cause so you have to think of that because you have hepatomyopathy and weakness which basically would mean that this could be a dense syndrome so developmental delay along with you have got the muscular weakness as well so this child you should do definitely a potassium atp channel defect was found and kcnj11 treatment was given with sulfonylurea 15 day old girl birth weight 1800 i think this we have already discussed so what we expect in this scenario is that on follow up they may develop a recurrence of disease later on so if you have a transient form you will have first of all you will develop diabetes then you will have hypoglycemia in the newborn in the in the infancy period and then you will have recurrence later on which will again respond to a scenario of sulfonylurea this turned out to be a abcc8 defect doing very well on glibenzlamide 12 month old girl with failure to thrive birth weight is 2500 grams blood sugar is 360 non ketotic family history of consanguinity so what is the very significant cause of consanguinity and diabetes the most common form of genetic diabetes most diabetes are like what they are recessive or dominant monogenic ones they generally dominant so which one are recessive so there on you will get the answer for this so family history of consanguinity so this is most likely to be a scenario of walker trellison syndrome so if you have a digit abnormality if you have got some skeletal dysplasia there is a family history of consanguinity walker trellison will be a very very important scenario in that regards and you will identify them two month old boy with failure to thrive blood sugar 320 multiple skin infections diarrhea and gad is positive so do you think this is type 1 so it is more like a ipex syndrome fox p3 so definitely gad positivity is not because of type 1 this is suggestive of a immune diabetes in that scenario 14 year old girl with polyuria sugar is 340 hp1c is elevated non ketotic slightly obese family history is there labeled as type 2 and started on metformin again do you agree or not so definitely you have to do the guarantee body here otherwise they will develop into dk so this message again is very very important that do not label anybody as type 2 unless you have excluded a autoimmunity in this scenario 11 year old girl on routine investigations blood sugar fasting is 118 prandial is 131 she is lean there is no acanthosis what do you think about these results is it diabetes first of all this is pre diabetes but a lean individual developing pre diabetes pre diabetes okay. 
and what is happening from fasting to 2 hour value hmm. yes so you have to ask for a family history there was non ketotic hbo1c was also in the pre diabetic range and once somebody gave insulin developed hypoglycemia now all the mother and her sisters which means maternal aunts actually had the similar picture and they did not have a problem until they became pregnant when their sugars used to shoot up so this was a classical case of gck deficiency which is there in that regard 15 year old girl with osmotic symptoms fasting is 222 r is 380 hba1c is 10.4 dk managed with insulin lean no acanthosis family history in mother okay and there is fluctuating sugars her sometimes she is off insulin also for few days then develops hypoglycemia if you give insulin then hyperglycemia uh, so what are you thinking here you have to think of a genetic form type 2 of course is unlikely in this scenario so what is happening in this regards targeted panel should have hnf1 beta defect and she had in, uh, renal cysts which were present 17 year old boy with weight loss fasting 140 to r 220 hba1c is 8.5 keto negative bmi is 26 what do you think here normal blood glucose and metformin was stopped there was history of neonatal hypoglycemia so hnf1 alpha and 4 alpha are known to cause macrosomia and hypoglycemia in the newborn period and then they have a subsequent development of diabetes so think of a hnf4 alpha and they will respond dramatically to they are exquisitely sensitive to uh, sulfonylurea so you started a very low dose in the scenario 11 year old girl with type 1 diabetes diagnosed at 8 years of age on insulin one unit complains of visual complaint and was reported as retinopathy what do you think could this be diabetic retinopathy no 3 years before 3 hmm. years extremely unlikely because it is considered that in the pre pubertal age group the chances of diabetic complications are much less so what will you think of so you have to think of other things there was optic atrophy so now you should do a genetic testing so if you have a non autoimmune type of diabetes with early onset quote unquote retinopathy think of a wolfram syndrome as a possibility 14 year old girl with emaciated appearance blood sugar fasting is very high 2 hours is 566 there is very high hba1c ketones are negative bmi is very lean so what are you thinking of <coughs> so this is classical presentation of lipodystrophy their insulin requirements will be very very high so in this scenario you may think of a addition of leptin otherwise treatment is very very difficult 19 year old girl with developmental delay visual defect deafness and random sugar was found to be 240 so she was not diagnosed as diabetes till now hba1c is 8.4 gad is negative on metformin she worsened so what do you think is happening here <laughs> so there multi system involvement of course did mode could be a possibility but mitochondrial also you have to think of there is maternal diabetes as well so this was a mitochondrial diabetes do not use metformin in this disorder because anyway they are prone to lactic acidosis so this is the midd variant which is uh, basically the deafness along with developmental delay which is happening 14 year old boy with obesity there is polydactyly nectalopia blood sugar is slightly elevated hb1c 7.4 so diagnosis so classically bardet beetel syndrome and these individuals will respond very well to metformin in this scenario 16 year old girl with hyperglycemia blood sugar are only marginally elevated lean individual low c peptide and gad negative there is anemia neuropathy and pigmentation so this looks like a genetic diabetes lean individual and low c peptide gad negative but which genetic Roger syndrome 
So this is most likely, we'll discuss about these again. So megaloblastic anemia, think of Rogers syndrome, which is a transporter defect in the thiamine. So B12 and insulin will be able to help out. So 17 year old girl with hirsutism, FGS of 21, severe acanthosis, although she is lean and blood sugar is 145 and 221. Ultrasound shows large ovaries and PCO appearance. What do you think here? So this is the insulin resistance syndrome, which may be type A or type B, either autoimmune or that in that perspective. So this is a insulin resistance, which is a progressive disease, which becomes important. Three-year-old boy with failure to thrive, emaciated with muscular appearance, loss of subcutaneous fat, sugars are slightly high, HbA1c is slightly high, hepatomegaly high ALT and triglyceride levels. What are you thinking of? And there is acanthosis also. So, and this is very early onset. So, it will be more like a congenital form of lipodystrophy. Acquired typically happens after an autoimmune disease. So, this is more like a congenital form. And you can have various defects like ag 2 defect, which is also there. 12-year-old boy with polyuria with developmental delay, hyperphagia, infantile hypotonia. So, the diagnosis, I think, is very clear. This will be a classical feature of Cadaville. And this was a classical scenario, which you have to think of. So, definitely there are various disorders which can be associated. And you can think of metformin and GLP-1 analog. So, to conclude, this is our uh, complicated algorithm. If somebody is less than 6 months of age, you consider neonatal diabetes. 6 to 12 months, GAD antibody negative. Then you consider neonatal. Between 1 to 10 years, mainly it's considered type 1. Unless the insulin requirement is below 0.5 unit per kg per day for a period of one year. Then you do a GAD antibody. If GAD is negative, go for genetics testing. Around 10 years and above, look at DKA diagnosis or not. If DKA present, go back to your 1 to 10 year old protocol. We don't want to do unnecessary GAD or genetic testing. Above 10 years, no DKA diagnosis. Then you can think of if the child is overweight. In that scenario, you do a GAD antibody to identify type 2 diabetes. If the child is lean, then you continue the same cycle, wait till at least one year to identify that. And this is something which helps you achieve the right diagnosis.